We're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I want us to see what the Apostle Paul is writing to this young preacher of the gospel. Paul says, now the Spirit expressly says, that in the latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves, listen to this carefully, by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits, and teaching of demons. Though the insincerity of liars, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the word, words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. I want you to think about what Paul is telling Timothy here. He says there are going to be times. He says specifically in the last latter days. In other words, in the last times, there will be those who will depart from the truth. And there, there are those who depart from the truth for particular reasons. He says that they are going to depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits. Teachings of demons. These are going to come through the insincerity of liars. Today I want to talk to you, particularly to the kids, about preparing your kids to meet such challenges. There's a notion that floats around in society today I've heard it said in the workplace, I've heard it said in other environments. What you don't know won't hurt you. What you don't know won't hurt you. What do you think of this, kids? Can you be hurt by something that you don't know? In the Bible, I want you to consider Nadab and Abihu. Those can be found in Leviticus chapter 10. We know that they offered strange fire to God and were destroyed. Or what about Uzzah? He was, riding, he was hauling the ark of God on a cart rather than by staves and put out his hand to stable the ark that it would not fall and he was destroyed. Killed by God. Or what about, perhaps, a little child who sees a receptacle, an electrical receptacle, much like the one up here. What about a child who decides to stick a key in the electrical receptacle? Does what the child not understand about electricity, is it possible for that electricity to hurt him or yes. her? I would like you to entertain what we don't know has the power to do great harm to us. We live in an era when information is at our fingertips. You have access via computers, cell phones, to the internet, a vast amount of knowledge. A vast amount of knowledge is available to you and to anyone around us. And yet general knowledge and common sense are fastly, fast slipping away from us. As we drown ourselves in what I would refer to as static, video games, television, simple nonsense that's out there, you know, the internet is full of all kinds of great and valuable information. 
Yet I dare say most of us use it simply for pleasure that has no gain other than entertainment. Turn back with me in your Bibles to the book of Hosea for a moment. Hosea was a prophet in the Old Testament. In fact, I think Hosea is maybe one of my favorite prophets known as a minor prophet. Hosea chapter 4 and in verse 6, Hosea is listening to God. I want to, I want to get the context, so back up with me to verse 4. Yet yeah, let no one contend, and let none accuse, for with you is my contention, O priest. You shall stumble by day. The priest in the temple. God says, God says, my problem is with the religious leaders of Israel. My problem, my fight, my argument is with the religious leaders of the day. That's what he's saying here to Hosea. And it's what Hosea is telling the people. You shall stumble by day. The prophet also shall stumble by night. And I will destroy your mother. Here is what he says. Here is the reason God is angry with the religious leaders of the day. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Hosea's message to the people of his day is that they had forgotten God. They were being destroyed spiritually for a lack of knowledge and understanding about who God was. Consider with me very briefly the story of our very first president, George Washington. George Washington was a great man and a great leader. However, sometime after his presidency in December of 1799, George Washington became very sick with a cold. His doctor bled him four times in one day. Within a few hours, he was dead. For thousands of years, it was believed that diseases started in the blood and by, quote, bleeding the patient, one could eliminate the disease from the human body. In truth, bleeding did nothing but weaken the patient. And in George Washington's case, bring about death. I often wonder if the doctor who, minute, who uh, practiced, if you will call it that, on George Washington ever thought that he would be remembered as the man who killed the first president. Yet that was considered to be common knowledge and the way things were accomplished during that period of time. One would cut the arm and allow blood to flow into a bowl in order to bleed the patient. The truth, however, was available thousands of years before the myth of bleeding was ever thought of. Turn back with me, for example, and just to make the point, to the book of Leviticus, chapter 17. In God's Old Testament law, his covenant with Israel, this is, this is when Moses originally penned it. In Leviticus, chapter 17, in verse 11, God makes a very simple statement in regards to blood and particularly life. Leviticus 17 and in verse 11, begin with me actually in verse 10. If anyone in the house of Israel or the house of the strangers who sojourn among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. Why? God says in verse 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you 
given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. It's a very simple concept. It is a concept that should have alerted doctors during George Washington's era. A time when men actually sought truth in scriptures, he should have alerted them. But they were so focused on the customs of the day that they did not listen to what the Bible taught. How many times in Jesus' ministry did he say, have you not read? It's all written there. It's all contained. Mysteries we read about in our Bible study this morning in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul talks about the mysteries of God. And yet Hosea says that God's perish for a lack of knowledge. Knowledge, how important is it? Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, back at the back of our New Testaments, 1 Peter chapter 3, begin reading, if you will, in verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, Peter emphasizes the necessity of understanding our faith, not being blind or simply believing, but I want you to see what he says. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, Peter says, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous? For what is good. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts honor Christ. The Lord is holy. And notice what he says. He says, always, always, kids, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. But I want you to notice what he says. Be ready always to give an answer. How difficult that is. We never know what the question might be. So we have to have a knowledge of our faith. We cannot simply say that I believe. You know, I'm the type of person, I have a personality, that I want to understand the thought process. I want to understand why. We have children who are constantly asking why. I'm going to go just to one of these passages listed, Proverbs chapter 2, if you will, verse 10. These are all passages in which Solomon is stressing the importance of wisdom. And so they're, they're parallel passages. I would encourage you to look them up on, you know, as, as you have opportunity. But Hebrews, or Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 10 for wisdom will come into your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Having knowledge is, is a very satisfying thing. You know, when I come up with an answer to a question that I have about my faith, or I learn something new about my faith, there is, there is very little that is more satisfying to me than to find an answer in the Word of God. It has always troubled me if I do something but don't understand why. I suppose it's because I've always asked why. I want to understand the reason. And if, if I can follow the reason and the logic, then I can accept that someone has thought this through. I may disagree with the conclusion that they've come to. But at least I can accept that someone has put consideration into something. And I respect that. Knowledge. I want you to consider some logical reasons for knowing. 
Knowledge gives substance and depth to our faith. Without knowledge, our faith is blind. And without knowledge, we are going simply on what we are told. God never expects us to have blind faith. Hebrews chapter 1 and or chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 identifies faith as paraphrasing being untangible. Faith is belief in something that we cannot see. Let's look at let's look at the exact phraseology here. Hebrews chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 the Hebrew writer says Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In other words, faith is believing in something that we cannot see, we cannot feel, we cannot touch, it is not tangible. But it is the belief and the assurance that it is accurate and real. Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 32 says, Know the truth, and the truth, will set you free. That John 8, 32 is a idea that we know the truth. Again, faith is not blind. Faith is based on substance. And if we remain faithful to God, it is because we have a depth of understanding of our faith. Knowledge stabilizes faith in times of testing. We will all go through times of testing throughout our lives, and it is important that our faith remain steady. In the book of James, chapter 1, James talks about one who is unsteady, who doesn't have the depth of knowledge. Yeah, the one who does not have a depth of knowledge is unstable. James, James chapter 1 verse 8 says, um, he says, uh, he is a, well, let's, let's back up a little bit. Let's back up to verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. So that's the first thing we need to do if we want to understand something. We need to ask God for guidance, and we will receive the guidance. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. If we ask God for knowledge and we are willing to meet God in that quest for knowledge, God will grant us that knowledge and understanding so that we are no longer like a wave on the ocean. Waves are just that. They're just ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. They're driven by wind. And the wind might drive a wave one direction and then drive a wave another direction, depending on the circumstances. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Colossian Christians in Colossians chapter 2, and in verse 9 says this, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all authority. In him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by, the putting, up, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who has raised him from the dead, and you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, made alive together with him by having forgiven us all our trespasses, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to his cross. 
You see, Paul is wanting the Colossian Christians to have an understanding, a fuller knowledge of what it means to be a child of God, what it means to be a Christian, to have their faith stabilized through that knowledge. Knowledge enables us to handle the Bible correctly. Back to 2 Timothy this time, but let's see what Paul tells us, this young preacher again. 2 Timothy instead of 1 Timothy, this time chapter 2 and in verse 15. This is a passage that I have long appreciated. 2 Timothy 2 and in verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, let's back up to verse 14. Paul says, remind them of those things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words. In other words, Paul's addressing this preacher about people who are arguing about the meaning of words regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we do that today. We argue about words. Paul says, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. He tells Timothy this. He says, do your best, young man. Do your best to present yourself to God as approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. That word, rightly handling, those words right there. Some of your translations, if you're reading the King James, it will say rightly dividing the word of truth. If I were writing a translation, the word rightly handling is orthotomeo. It is a Greek word, and it means to dissect correctly or to cut a straight path. If I were writing it, I would probably use the word dissect, rightly dissecting the word of truth. Knowledge comes through. When we want to learn more about a specimen, we dissect it. We put it under a microscope. We study it. So when Paul tells Timothy, here in 2 Timothy 2 and in verse 15, when Paul says that he is to do his best to present himself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, he says, rightly dissecting the word of truth. Rightly studying, rightly dissecting, gaining in knowledge. My knowledge of the Word of God helps me to correctly handle the Word of God. And that knowledge brings additional knowledge. Knowledge equips me to direct and confront false teachings or lies. I think that's something that is very important in today's society. In which we live, we are surrounded, constantly bombarded by the LGBTQ movement in which they are interested in pushing an agenda. How do I know that it's wrong? Without knowledge, without study of the scripture, I would have no way of knowing that it was wrong and nothing to base it upon. However, the scriptures calls it an abomination. What about any other number of things? that our society might throw at us. What about abortion? How do we know it's wrong? We have to have a basic knowledge and understanding of the scriptures. Our conscience might dictate it's wrong. We might feel that it's wrong, or we might feel that it's right. But without a knowledge, we have no way to make a defense. That was Peter's entire reason for his commandment to the to Christians in his letter was that they needed to be able to make a defense. They needed to be able to explain to, Christ, to other people in the world why Christians believe certain things and why we act in certain ways. Let's go back into the book of Proverbs again. This time chapter 1 in verse 22. Solomon says, How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? You know, when I was a kid, I hated school. I didn't want to learn school things. 
it was when I began to study things that interested me when I began to appreciate the ability to learn. The Bible is full of things that will interest probably anyone around. We simply have to have a knowledge of how to find them. We have to study it. We have to dissect it. Proverbs 11 and verse 9, Solomon says, With his mouth the godless man would destroy his neighbor, but by knowledge the righteous are delivered. You see how important it is and how it equips us to deal with each, with all of these things that life might throw at us. You know, the truth is that the, knowing the Bible doesn't just give us a defense for our faith. Knowing the Bible doesn't simply just equip us to be better Christians. I see, the Bible, having the knowledge of the Bible, equips us for life. I still say that if we, if we take literally what Peter says, that he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Our lives would be richer, fuller, more meaningful. And we would be a happier, more pleasant individual. Let's see exactly what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Peter says his divine power, God's divine power, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How do we get them? He says through the knowledge of him, through the knowledge of God, who has called us to his own glory and excellence. That's how we gain that knowledge. That's how we gain understanding. That's what gives us the appreciation for life. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, drop down with me if you will, to verse 5. Peter says, For this very reason, make, no, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours, and are increasing, notice that, not just that you obtain these qualities, but that they grow inside of you. They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent. Confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an inheritance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we wrap this lesson up, I've got a few closing thoughts I want to share with you. A strong church may not be the largest in number. A strong church may not be a church that has the most diversity, the most programs, the most under- the, the, the largest college or seminary, but a strong church may simply be the church that is the most interested in learning and growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Turn with me back to the Old Testament again. I want you to notice what God's will was for the children of Israel before they entered the promised land in Deuteronomy chapter 6 God gave some very specific instructions through his servant Moses as to how the children of Israel were to pass on from one generation 
to the next generation. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and if you will, begin with me in verse 4. But pay close attention to verse 7. Moses says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Notice verse 7. You, you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them. Now notice, this is how we're to teach them to our children. You're to talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. There was a family that lived in our neighborhood when I was growing up. They were way up in their 90s. The, the, the husband had passed away. But before Ray Franks died, every farm building, every gate had a Bible verse. Every building he owned had a Bible verse written over the door. Now I remember as a child going and seeing over the one building, the, the passage talks about seed time and harvest. And I remember all of these, every, every verse that the building on which it was written. All of the, almost all of those buildings are gone now. And all of the lettering has been painted over. But what I appreciated about Ray Franks, who died before I was born, was there was a man who took literally this passage of writing on his gates the words of God to pass that on to a generation that had not yet even been born. Teach them to your children. Diligently to your children, he says. You shall talk of them when you sit in your houses. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Constantly, constantly, constantly. We should talk about what God has taught us. What we have learned about God. What we have learned from his word should be a constant conversation with our kids. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 22, very quickly, Ezekiel 22 and in verse 30. Ezekiel 22 and verse 30, the prophet Ezekiel says this. And again, it's God speaking. And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall. The wall of Israel, the wall of Jerusalem was destroyed. God is searching for a man. He's searching for a man to rebuild. Rebuild his city. And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach. A breach is a gap before me and the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. I wonder if God were to analyze the United States of America. How many, how many individuals, how many men and women would he find willing to stand in the gap between him and destruction? He looked at Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham got him to say that if he found ten righteous people, he would not destroy the city. God looked and he didn't find ten. Ignorance, my friend, is not bliss. It is the breeding ground of fear, control, prejudice, superstition, and slavery. 
I'll leave you with those thoughts this morning. Ignorance is not bliss. Knowledge. Knowledge and wisdom are understanding. And a knowledge of the word of God will form, will form in you young people's minds a foundation that cannot be shaken. We have opportunity for invitation. If there's anyone who has a need of that, I would encourage you to make that known as together we sing 310.